Hi, I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. Today we have a special episode that is going to be highlighting the neurodiversity leaders we've interviewed over the past several months who are addressing the issue of stigma. Stigma is something we battle here every day at Different Brains, and these leaders are about to tell you why. Our first guest is Jeff Emerson, a mental health advocate, public speaker, author, and massive social media icon in the mental health arena. You went through a, uh, um, a, long, a long haul uh, in order for you to get your diagnosis. Tell us about your diagnosis and the path to getting your diagnosis. Yeah, it's... Uh... It was interesting and, and was a major driving force in why I wrote the book that I did, at least the first book. So um, I have to remember it all, obviously, but going back, it uh, it all really came down to having a few, you know, checklist type tests from the DSM and, and, and uh, others uh, to rule out things like the bipolar disorders, one and two, cyclothymia, hypomania. Uh, anxiety disorders, um, you know, and, and several others, acute and chronic depression uh, and other things. And what we, the way it, the way it culminated, I guess, to make a long story short, um, is that through all those, all those tests and things, basically the, the, I call it the label sometimes, but the diagnosis of ADHD was the one we went with. And I know that kind of sounds um, perhaps a bit uh, shoddy, or, <laughs> if you will, but I, I just, I remember to this day when it was almost suggested to me that, well, you know, maybe it's ADHD, let's go with that, let's see how medication works for it. And um, certainly, you know, by well-meaning people uh, and, you know, all that stuff, you know, people did their best to try and rule things out and from childhood trauma to other things. Uh, diet, nutrition, <clears throat> excuse me, exercise, all that stuff, trying to look at my overall life from a holistic perspective. But, um, and I didn't know any better myself at the time. So I thought, well, okay, I'll go along with this ADHD diagnosis. And it seemed at first hacky to uh, be an overwhelming sigh of relief, because at least I, I knew, as I've heard others say, you know, it's like a weight was lifted, there was some explanation into why, you know, a lot of my past happened like it did not as a crutch, obviously, or anything like that, uh, as someone who's very driven, but couldn't seem to convert that to success in any given area. <clears throat> um, so yeah, long story short, we went with that diagnosis. Uh, I remember researching some medications at the time, trying to figure out what might be, you know, maybe some more modern, um, cleaner, I remember was a term we used, uh, medications that, uh, Again, I, not being the doctor myself, I, I'm, no, I'm no expert there, but um, Adderall versus Ritalin sort of thing and, and some others we were looking at. And essentially all I did was go on, um, excuse me, Adderall for about six, seven weeks roughly. And that was it. Uh, and I noticed absolutely zero change. Um, I think I was on maybe two dosages at the time. So again, I know this is somewhat crude, but uh, looking back, uh, you know, and it was like a shot in the dark, uh, something while on that medication, speaking with my wife at the time, I realized I'm not really noticing much. Is this really supposed to help solve things? Uh, obviously I was completely green. So from that, uh, it started the whole journey hacky into questioning my diagnosis and digging deeper. Next up, we have Pierre Marsh, who is a civil and commercial mediator writing a book about dyslexia, and a dedicated advocate for neurodivergence and neurodiversity. I'm of the opinion, which I've taken some criticism for, that labels are a lousy way to describe a human being. Um, some of the well-intentioned leaders and people say, well, yeah, then how are you going to get people the resources they need? What are you going to do? So I find sometimes that Advocates like you, <clears throat> organizations like differentbrains.org, we're trying to get rid of the stigma so that everybody can feel comfortable saying, hey, I'm dyslexic, but I'm going to do the job, or I have Asperger's, or 
you know, you name it, ADHD, the list goes on and on. But finding that ability to come out of the closet, so to speak, and say, you know, I want everybody to know I'm bipolar and I have to be on my meds. And if I get off my meds, make sure you make sure I take them. But right now, it's like everybody's got to look the other way and there's a lot of stigma involved. Tell me about stigma and labels from your perspective. What well, is very important, and I think you hit the nail on the head. The question is, is functionality. How good are we are doing our jobs? That, to me, is the most fundamental uh, point. The second point is, it's a question of intelligence, right? And one of the things about neurodivergence is it is intelligence in its own right. And I believe that neurodivergent people for a long time have had to translate their intelligence to a neurotypical way of doing things. So the burden is absolutely immense. But the intelligence grows because of that process. One of the things I think which neurodivergence has to uh, develop into is that there is a specific way of measuring neurodivergence intelligence for neurodivergence intelligence sake. And that is a more holistic way of actually uh, fathoming out how people actually do things. It's no point at the age of three teaching a neurodivergence sequential thinking uh, uh, development when all the time their ability to create and learn and understand the world is from a holistic perspective. And so what happens is that child fails, 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 gets the labels, gets the remedial uh, training, and then gets the self low self-esteem. And all the time, it becomes, because it's with professionals, it becomes not a difference, it becomes articulated as a pathology. And it's from that discourse that there is absolutely no challenge to it. And that's why it's so important for new divergent people. It's to start from what you say. It's not a question of looking from a issue of difference and deficit. It's a, 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 a process of identifying that there are different brains which process information differently. And what we've got to do as humanity is capitalize on the whole sum of human intelligence in order so we can benefit from it. Because I believe we're in somewhat of a crisis mode where we've got so used to doing things from standard operational procedures. And historically, those who had quite a good working memory to remember the standard operational procedures became the bosses and the leaders. But it's all taken us to one place, which has not given us choice, choice of thought, choice of creativity. And I think it's the new divergence brain, which is the key here to give humanity options, which it hasn't got at the moment. So it's very important. Now we have the brilliant Dr. Chris Stout, a clinical psychologist, philanthropist, author, and podcast host. On the site for the Center for Global Initiatives, I just want to read this. This caught my eye because the last guy I heard talk like this was a, a way back. I went, took a two-week course in Washington, D.C. in orthopedic pathology when I was still in medical school by a guy named Lent Johnson, who was an iconoclast. And he was head of the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And he saw the whole prism of the world like this. I'm quoting from, on the site for the center, a quote, quote, health is perhaps the most common denominator in a region's potential for success as it is so intertwined with economic sustainability, eradicating poverty, preventing war, mitigating violence, and fostering social prosperity. Can you expound upon that in terms of acceptance of mental health and everything we're talking about here? There is a uh, um, fellow, Jordan Caslow, who is a uh, ophthalmologist, and he was really sort of the inspiration of that perspective on my part. And one of the things that 
he talked about was looking at this. This is sort of really, again, being holistic in a different way. We talked about just now being holistic and looking at a person as a system. But when you look at cultures and you look at regions and you look at places in the world that are, are hot spots, they're systems as well, too. And oftentimes the socially disenfranchised, the marginalized, the abused, the stigmatized are those that have mental health kinds of issues. Um, oftentimes there's very little empathy. And this, this isn't just to developing places. You know, this is, you know, here in North America, you know, it's, it's, it, unfortunately it's a, it's a global issue. Some places are more accepting and more open than others. Some people are more accepting and open than others. But I had worked at the United Nations, uh, 1998, 1999. And one of the things that I worked on was the, the aspect of looking at mental health and substance abuse vis-a-vis -vis sustainable development. And sort of the argument or the thesis that I had in that, which relates back to the quote that you very generously used, was uh, that if you, if without mental health, there is no health, so to speak. That issues of, you can be, um, the needing this kind of assistance, regardless of whatever kind of circumstance you're in, and if you're not getting that, it's gonna be hard to be a good parent. It's gonna be hard to be a good worker. It's gonna be hard to be a good contributor to your community or to your tribe or whatever. And it makes it really, ironically, I think, a, a fundamental aspect of being successful in every other aspect of one's life. Even if you're, you know, biologically, so to speak, or physically fit or healthy, if you, you know, are suffering with debilitating chronic clinical depression, you're not going to be able to go work. You're not going to be able to support a family, things like that. So, so that's the kind of aspect of, of, you know, what that point was trying to get to. Next, let's hear from one of our board members at Different Brains, Dr. Lori Butts, the president and director of the Clinical and Forensic Institute and past president of the Florida Psychological Association. What would you say the biggest roadblock to getting rid of the stigma is? I think it's just the society belief. I, I just, I think that it's scary. Um, mental, uh, it's, it's, it's lack of education about kind of the fear about mental illness. Um, even people with mental illness don't want to be perceived as having mental illness because it's embarrassing. Um, they get um, problems, discrimination, uh, problems getting, moving up in, in jobs, problems getting jobs. Um, I think there's a lot of roadblocks. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's difficult for people to talk about and to accept that um, mental health and medical health are the same. We, we need to be healthy both in our minds and in our bodies and we'll have longer lives if we take care of both of our, our brains and our bodies. Next we have Dr. Stephen Ronick. He is the CEO of Henderson Behavioral Health one of the oldest, largest, and most successful providers of recovery services for persons with co-occurring disorders here in Florida. What is the biggest single thing about what you do that would surprise our viewers? I think uh, what one of the biggest surprises would be for the general community is um, it's misunderstood um, around the science that underlies mental health treatment. Sometimes there's stigma, not just about people who have mental health conditions, but even stigma towards the profession in general. Uh, mental health professionals are very regulated, more regulated and monitored and audited almost in any other division of healthcare, which if you think about it, probably has something to do with folks not believing in it enough. So a lot of people don't understand that mental health conditions are brain diseases, they're treatable, treatment works really well. Um, mood disorders, major depression for example, when people get that treated the right way gets better about 80, 85 percent of the time. People who are treated for heart conditions, it's about 50 percent recovery rate. So mental health treatment is super effective and I think that's one of the things that unfortunately people don't understand well enough. For our final clip, we have the great Dr. Bankole Johnson, neuroscientist and one of the world's foremost experts on addiction. He was featured in the HBO documentary Addiction and is head of the Brain Science Research Consortium Unit at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Why is it 
And I'll quote here Steve Ronick. Why is it when you go to a cardiologist or an oncologist, there's no stigma? But if you go to a mental health professional, there's a stigma attached, and we get better results. We get better results. And what you're doing there, it sounds like it may help get rid of the whole stigma to all of this. I couldn't agree with you more. And it's really very curious. And I think it dates back to a few hundred years whereby people tried to separate the mind from the body in some way as if there were two components of a system that never really talked about another. And this mind was meant to be some higher order type of cognitive thinking. And the body was meant to be basically the mechanics. And they were not connected. So when you go and see someone because you have a mental health issue, people believe that it must be due to something to do with this nebulous concept of a mind and that it's somehow your responsibility while you're ill, or at least partially your responsibility, and it has nothing to do with your body. Well, we now know that this is completely incorrect. The brain is the most complex organ in the, uh, in the universe. It has connections with your heart. It has connections with basic, almost everything else. And to give your friend the heart analogy, we now know that individuals who have heart disease often also have mental manifestations of that heart disease and brain stress or stress in the brain is also associated with myocardial infarction or cardiac arrest and, and cardiovascular disease. So it's one system. I think some people like to make it simple, but as my professor used to say, it can only be as simple as it really is. <laughs>